right hi everybody i just wanted to give you guys a recording of this speech um, i know i had mentioned that you can log on to office hours but obviously office hours just are not ideal for everybody in front of me you see um i do have it's a blanket it's nothing fancy it's literally a blanket on a chair this is my podium this just kind of gives me something to kind of uh, lock into that way i'm not like swaying back and forth during my speech um i am using my phone to record myself um, during my speech here I also have my speech right in front of me. There's a computer right in front of me. So I have this right here in front of me. I'm actually going to make it a little bit larger. That way, whenever I am reading it, I don't have any issues. And I can kind of see, you know, what it is that I'm looking at here. And I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, what you will hear during my speech is I'm going to stop a few times during the speech so I can kind of remind you the different parts of a speech. That way you can kind of make sure that you have everything that you need as well in yours. So I'll go ahead and get started. For right now, I'd like for you all to consider this scenario. How would you feel if you had never had access to your birth certificate or never had any of your any record of your medical history? I am imagining this scenario may feel uncomfortable and rightfully so, yet sadly this is the scenario for too many children. It is to be assumed that making the choice to place a child up for adoption is not always the preferred choice, but according to CNN.com, a recent survey found that 100 infant adoptions programs in the United States reported that 5% of those adoptions were completely closed, and while 55% were fully open and 40 were mediated through an agency. But the study said this is that 5% is still too many. I believe closed adoption policies need to be evaluated due to the rise of social media, the improvement of technology, and our growing access to data. Each of these factors are making it tremendously difficult for new age families to keep closed adoptions actually closed. I would like to let you into my life personally as adult who is a product of open adoption. And my hope is that through clear definitioning, reasoning, and stories that you are going to leave here today feeling well-informed and motivated to help me make a change to close adoptions and the policies that exist in North Carolina. Though you may not know someone directly until now who is adopted as college students, it is not uncommon that you or a friend may be forced to make such a decision. And let's face it, pregnancies that happen are sometimes just unexpected. Yet who a pregnant young woman is at 18 or even 20 years old will not be the same person she is 10 to 15 years down the road. Therefore, I believe closed adoption policy should make room for the possibility of a change of heart. Now, though we do know adoption can take place at any stage of life, during my speech, most scenarios and statistics will be surrounded around adoptions that occur at birth. Now, before I get started, I would like it. I would like to make it uh, a note here um, to acknowledge that some birth parents choose close adoption due to their circumstances, and some of those circumstances are just simply out of their control. This speech is not intended to trample over any of those choices or those tough decisions that parents bravely have to decide to make, but instead to highlight the benefits of opening an adoption when and if there is emotional and mental space for it. Today, we are going to discuss four main points. The very first is I will provide clear reasoning or clear definitions for both open and closed adoption. Secondly, the problem with closed adoption and the answers that open adoption provide. And lastly, we'll discuss the possibility that grow from adopting my plan. Now let's pause right here. In my speech here, you hear I'm mentioning a few things. I'm going to kind of go through my introduction here. You've heard that I've given you an attention getter. I asked you to consider a scenario, okay? So it was a quick little one-two for my, my attention getter. The next piece here is I went ahead and gave you one of my sources. You might have recalled like during your, your speeches that you or your working outline, you might not have put all of your sources inside of that working outline, but when you're putting together your speaking outline, you want to make sure that those sources are ready to be spoken. So again, using phrases like according to CNN.com or when I was doing my research on this website, I learned this thing in particular. So I've already knocked out one of my six sources. I've also stated very plainly what my, my speech is going to be about. I've given you my credibility, telling you that I'm adopted. I've also named my main points here. And in my main points, I've given you that I'm going to talk to you about a problem, a solution, and visualization, which tells you that I'm using Monroe's motivated sequence here. So let's just go ahead and jump right into the, the meat of my speech here. First, let me allow uh, let me allow me to define both open and closed adoption. 
That's a transition, by the way. Defining opening, closing, uh, close adoption. According to AmericanAdoptions.com, a close adoption is a type of adoption in which the adoptive family and birth parents share little to no contact with one another. So to give you an example of what close adoption kind of looks like um, versus um, open adoption, I'm going to do some, some visuals here, or I'm going to have you kind of visualize, visualize this. So when we think of a close adoption, we think of almost like a door. Um, so say there was a door and it was closed and there was a lock on it and you can't get in it. You can't do anything about it. You can't get inside of it because the door is locked on both sides. There's no way for you to get inside of this here. Now, according to childwelfare.gov, open adoption, on the other hand, is a form of adoption that allows birth parents to know and to have contact with the adoptive parents and the adopted child. Now, the interesting thing about open adoption is, is there are many little moving parts that come with open adoption. This now means the open adoption is kind of like a door that's almost like open, but in some ways it can be cracked and it can be wide open. There are just different ways to kind of look at open adoption. So I'd like to kind of explain some of the different options when it comes to open adoption. You could have an open adoption that is completely open, meaning that the birth parents and the adoptive parents are in contact with one, one another. And they're kind of doing their own thing. They're talking to one another as they see fit. They might choose to email each other. They might choose to text each other pictures monthly. They will likely agree upon something um, before the child is born or before the adoption is actual fi actually finalized. The next step here, too, is that when we think about a mediated ad open adoption, this now means that we're working with an agency or somebody that's a third party that's kind of, you know, doing the in-between stuff. That person is likely an agency where maybe the adoptive parents will say, hey, we're going to reach out to the agency at some point and we're going to give you guys this picture of this little child and then they're going to communicate this back with you um, as time kind of goes on. And obviously, these things are kind of set in stone, again, well before the adoption actually happens. Now, the thing I want to highlight here is that when it comes to closed adoption, closed adoption, once it's closed, you can't change your mind on this. It's closed, it's closed, and there's no going back. Now, with open adoption, sometimes parents decide that to leave it fully open and the adoptive parents and the birth parents are talking to each other, and this seems decent. And sometimes they might even decide that I like to work with the agency for a little while before we, we're communicating back and forth with each other. So you can kind of play around with how you are doing open adoption versus closed. So now that we have clearly defined both closed and open adoption, let's discuss the problem with choosing closed adoption. According to Adopt, AmericanAdoptions.com, the largest problem with closed adoption is that they are becoming more difficult to maintain due to social media and at-home DNA tests. People are quickly discovering their identities of biological rel relatives, whether it is welcomed or not. Uh, I was reading a story on CNN.com. That is me, again, giving you one of my quotes. I was reading a story on CNN.com. And in the story, there was this guy, and I think he was somewhere in his 20s or so, and he was doing some of his DNA records or what have you, and I guess he started talking to one of his family members about what he was getting ready to do. And then he happened to get a message on Facebook from an estranged relative um, that kind of gave him the skinny on an adoption, his adoption, and he never even knew he was adopted. This happened within his family. So again, the importance here to recognize is that social media and technology will only improve over time, which will continue to increase the difficulty of keeping closed adoptions under wraps. And according to TheGuardian.com, not only is the rise of social media a problem for closed adoptions, but there is also no roadmap. We have no idea how good social media is going to get over the years. Uh, we are well beyond the first generation to grow up with social media, and as it continues to progress, these problems are going to become larger. If this is left unsolved, lives will continue to be disrupted. This means both by biological parents and adoptive children. So there are challenges here. Um, this means that now the adoptive parents will have challenges of answering questions, um, missed opportunities for parents and the adoptive parents, or the, excuse me, the biological parents and the adoptive child to actually bond with one another. And also the emotional challenges for both parents, birth parents. Sometimes when the birth parents has decided to close the adoption, they wanna leave it that way and they don't wanna have to come back to this. So now that we've tackled the problem at hand, let us talk about how this can be resolved. For adoptions that take place at birth, I propose that in the state of North Carolina, closed adoptions after 2021 should require birth and adoptive parents to remain in contact with the agency in which the closed adoption occurred, thus making it a five to 10 year requirement to reassess the case and apply for some form of open adoption as deemed appropriate. Now, this agreement would specify that both parties must agree to opening the adoption. So, 
birth mothers are grieving obviously whenever they give their child up for adoption or even again we're just simply talking about those adoptions that happen at birth birth mothers are grieving when they make the choice for the adoption to actually take place and asking a mother to revisit this five years later could very well be traumatizing i know what you're thinking here and this is why i'm proposing that the option is to simply be available for birth parents who choose a closed adoption and once one they, they are not forced to make but one that is available this means that this is not saying hey you have to after five to 10 years you have to make sure that you're opening this adoption in five to ten years if you're deciding that i don't know i kind of want to um that the at least have the option there according to pewtrust.org as of today about a half of all states allow adult adoptees some form of access to their original birth certificate without even going to court in at least nine states adult adoptees have unfettered access to those records so this is already happening across the united states in at least nine states this plan puts the birth parents the birth and adoptive parents in control which is what they should feel while also considering major factors as time goes on like social media or the redevelopment and continued development of DNA kids. So honestly we would be getting ahead of greater problems as we continue to assess the fact that social media is only going to continue to advance and continue to just get better and people are going to figure out ways to actually get you information even if sometimes you just don't want it. Lastly, let us explore the possibilities that can simply grow from choosing open adoption at birth or if my plan was to be put into effect. Birth parents, if this plan were to be put into effect, birth parents gain peace of mind. Adoptees will have knowledge of their background. Adoptive parents will know more about their child's family history and expected parents might decide to choose this option, especially if you consider some of the parents that are like, I, I'm in this pickle right now. This pregnancy, this pregnancy is unexpected, but I don't want to give the child up for adoption and I don't want it to be closed because once it's closed, I might not know what to do. But if they knew options like this exist, would they consider it? So as college students, today's decisions might not be tomorrow's. Ten years from now are not your actual reality um, once we get there. Um, as of who you were right now might not be who you are, let's say, when you're 38. Um, so again, consider that. Consider yourself of all the things that you liked um, ten years ago and all the things that of those ten things. Do you like them now? So missed opportunities with children will happen and lifelong grief will occur um, if this, uh, this plan is not adopted. Um, I would like to um, kind of wrap up my speech here, but to continue to reiterate one thing here. Um, we talked about a few things. We talked about social media and technology and our access to data and how it's only going to improve over time. And I want to leave you with this. I cannot stress this enough. Although you are college students today, I cannot stress this enough that today's decisions may not be tomorrow's. Um, I thank you for listening to my speech. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to email me. Whatever. Of course, if my audience is right here in front of me, I might tell my, my audience in the very beginning of my speech to hold their questions until the very end. This kind of helps so people are not doing this during your entire speech. Um, and so you actually have some time to get to those questions at the very end of your speech. Some people even go as far as telling your audience, I'm only answering two questions, so don't ask me a whole bunch of questions. So again, um, when you um, when you go through um, this, this speech, I'm gonna also give you this speech outline example here, as well as um, my this video. So you have both of them here. So you can kind of see that I'm using the exact same um, outline formats that some of you have decided to use if you did use Monroe's Motivated Sequence. And you'll see my reference page there too as well, um, just as you're being asked to do. I hope this was helpful. I hope you also see how fancy this is not um if you don't have a podium at home who does i don't um this again this is a blanket and this is my chair um so i've just kind of put this in front here but this again helps us kind of ground ourselves thank you for listening if you have any questions feel free to email me have a good one